I'm Kevin Davis, and this is the Catholic Family Podcast, and I'm very happy and honored today to be joined by Father Vili Le Taranta from St. Gertrude the Great. He's working now with Bishop Charles McGuire, used to work with Bishop uh, Daniel Dolan, may he rest in peace. And Father is going to tell us today about, well, a bit about his story and how he came to become a priest and even to, came to the U.S. I, I'm really interested to hear his story. I know very little about Father, so I'm excited. I hope as much as everyone else here to learn about his story and his trip to the priesthood. And anyone who follows the show knows that that we like to get to know the priests a little bit so that the priests, that the people can, what's the word, not not commiserate, but can can understand where the priests are coming from and understand that these are these are you know, human beings, that these are men doing their best to serve God and to bring us the sacraments and bring us the Holy Mass. So, Father Le Taranta, thank you so much for coming on. And, and I guess, I, I don't know where you want to begin. You want to begin with the, and, and we're also going to talk today about St. Gertrude the Great and some of the things that are going on there as well. But we'll start with your story, if you like, Father. Yes. Well, first of all, if I could start with a little prayer for it. Of course. Thank you, Father. Yeah, thank you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. O oh, adorable face of my Jesus, my only love, my light, and my life, grant that I may see, know, and love thee alone, that I may live with thee, of thee, and for thee. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Um, thank you very much, uh, Kevin. So, um, if you want to first go into my story, how I became a priest, then. That'd be great, Father, please. Okay, Whatever so, you want to tell us. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, so I was born and raised in Finland, and the kind of a religious uh, background is that I and my family uh, were Lutherans, like most of uh, the people in Finland uh, are. But we weren't, you know, really practicing our religion. That's something very common in Finland uh, now. Many people still belong to the state church, but are not practicing Lutherans. So myself, uh, my parents my siblings, uh, we didn't go to church, uh, but we were what is called kind of a habit Christians. So children were baptized and confirmed. And then if there was a special occasion like baptism or wedding, we went to church. And then sometimes we went to church on uh, Christmas. Uh, but um, regular life was just kind of a typical liberal Protestant secular uh, family, although my Mother did <laughs> teach me the nighttime prayer, which was uh, kind of a uh, nice, which I still remember kind of with uh, gratitude. So, and then, uh, but uh, so I wasn't religious when I was growing up, but one particular was that I always loved to read things. And when I was a very little boy, my mother used to read me fairy tales. And when I was old enough, um, I started to read myself. I loved Hans Christian Andersen, Astrid Lindgren, who are Nordic uh, writers and children uh, book uh, writers. And then um, when I became older, so I had a typical education, elementary, then middle school, high school. But uh, when I became a little older, I started to read about history. And still this day, I just love history. And I read about much about Roman Empire, which was very fascinating uh, for me. And then, especially when I started to read about uh, the French Revolution, then I started to learn about the Catholic faith and the, the Catholic uh, Church. So I would really credit the love to read uh, to the fact that I eventually became a Catholic and I became a priest. And, and Father, is that something that, that you, you say from the French Revolution, that that's interesting. So did you get a, a good impression of Catholicism from that? And was it because of the suffering of the Catholics or, or why did that give you an impression of Catholicism at that time frame? Well, well, first of all, I thought it because I didn't really know anything about the Catholic Church. So the big issue in French Revolution was that the you Nobel know, state wanted to take over the um, ruling and decisions uh, in the church. And uh, for me, it was kind of normal that state would do that because I grew up in a state church. So when I studied about French Revolution, it seemed strange that, you know, why for some Christians it was such a big deal that do they 
uh, follow the state or do they follow the Pope? You know, and that was another thing. I didn't know what the, the Pope uh, was. And I thought it's strange that, you know, some people make such a big deal about it that they are ready, ready to uh, go to exile or even die for their own church, for their own religion. And uh, so that started to me that I did a little research and I found that that this church for which these martyrs were ready to die, it was a church, the Catholic church, which could be traced all the way back to the apostles and to St. Peter and to Christ. So uh, truly the first spark of my conversion was that I read about the martyrs of uh, French uh, Revolution, and it fascinated me so much that I wanted to study more about the Catholic faith. It's interesting, Father. And, and were you a, a teenager at this time, or, or how old were you approximately? Um, yeah, I was in um, something like uh, 15 or 16 years old. Interesting. And so a after you you had this bit of a spark in interest in Catholic Church, what, what did you start to read that, that made you, I, I suppose, convert to Catholicism? What, what, what were the books, maybe just a few examples of what gave you that, hey, th this is the truth? Um, well, I studied, studied just the basics. Uh, um, there, were, there was a, a group of, uh, well, there is a Catholic diocese uh, of Helsinki, Finland, and they had published some kind of a uh, basic material about the church, about the, about the papacy. And uh, but um, after I so I read a little bit, you know, just the basic things. But fortunately, there were there was a small novo sort of parish in my home uh, town where I grew up. And more than starting to read, I started to attend their services, you know, novo sort of mass. And I also had some conversations with the priests who were serving there because. There were no Finnish priests there, but the parish were was served by Polish priests who belonged to the um, uh, the Society of the Sacred Heart, and uh, so I had little discussions with them. Um, then uh, uh, attended the services, then uh, went through that I don't know what's that called kind of an information course for converts, mm -hmm. where they went into more details uh, about the church, her history the sacraments, uh, the papacy, and then um, when it came time to make a decision that, you know, do I want to be a member of this uh, uh, church, then I already knew the priests there in the parish, I knew some people uh, there, so it were, eventually I did become a member of that noble sort of parish, and that was in when I was 20 years old. And Father, that's interesting you say that there were no Finnish priests, is that because there's just there just aren't many priests. Is, is, what what approximately is the percentage of Catholics uh, amongst the other religions in in Finland? Well, it's uh, very small. It's less than one percent. By the time I joined, wow. there was just you know few thousand members. Uh, now nowadays, because of immigration from other countries, uh, uh, I'm not certain how big the diocese is, but it's still extremely small main churches in finland are lutheran church and orthodox church and even to this day you know being a catholic in finland you know it's some kind of a anomaly you know so it's something which you very rarely uh, see uh, so uh, that's uh, that's how the religious situation in finland uh, is um, mostly lutheran and orthodox and catholicism is a very 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 tiny group Wow. And does that does that trace back all the way to, to Martin Luther, Father? Or when, when was that get changed? Or, or I guess, was Finland ever a Catholic country? I guess that, that's the first uh, question. Oh, it was. Um, so Finland's history is that we were first um, the colony of Sweden. And in the Middle Ages, uh, it was St. Henry and St. Eric. Um, St. Henry was a British uh, bishop and St. Eric was the king of uh, Sweden. And they made a crusade in the area which is now Finland in the 1100s. And they established the proper diocese there with the bishops, parishes, uh, priests. But then in the 1500s came Reformation. The whole Sweden became Lutheran and Catholicism was uh, outlawed. 
and um, it uh, wasn't until 1800s when parishes uh, came uh, back and even then like i said it was very very small uh, groups uh, because all the way until 1900s it was illegal for for Finns to be Catholics. Uh, uh, it was just uh, some foreigners, mostly Poles, who were living in Finland and who had their own priests uh, and, uh, and parishes. So, but um, because of the Napoleonic Wars in the early 1800s, Sweden lost Finland and Finland was annexed to uh, Russia. And um, this happened in 1809. So in the 1800s, it became a little easier to be a Catholic in Finland, but that privilege was reserved to foreigners, not to Finns. It was only after independence in 1917 when Finns could become Catholics as well. That's incredible. Wow, that, that's just, it's unbelievable to hear that that, that kind of persecution on, only 100 years ago, that that's just, you don't think that can happen in the Western world, I suppose, but that that's, that's unbelievable. And is that something, Father, I, I see often in the news that it seems like the Nordic countries are particularly progressive and, and modernistic. Is, is, that, is that the case with Finland as well? Um, well, yes, it's very progressive, very modernist. Uh, but, you know, I don't think Nordic countries have a special privilege for that because Britain and France, they are pretty bad nowadays. Germany too. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so... So yes, you know, Nordic idea. Oh yes, because um, uh, perhaps uh, it's true that in Nordic countries this uh, liberal tendencies started earlier because socialist parties they have mm -hmm. ever since hundred years ago always been the biggest parties in Nordic uh, countries. So that's certainly true, and you know, it didn't make evangelization any easier. So. Interesting. And so, Father, back to your story. When you were, you said when you were 20, you, you decided to join the Catholic Church. When did you have a feeling that you might want to become a priest? Um, it was something I thought about uh, for a long time. Um, it's, uh, I made some inquiries, you know, would it be possible to attend maybe the Society of Sacred Heart Seminary, which uh, was in Poland, or maybe you know, join some religious order like the like the Jesuits. Uh, but the idea of priesthood was just one of the future plans um, I was pondering or thinking. And by the time I was um, more grown up, I was studying in the University of Helsinki, and um, actually I was studying church history uh, there. And you know, so. Throughout my whole study period in university, priesthood was one thing what I was pondering, but you know, I also liked academic research, so that was one possibility to become a teacher or university uh, professor. Uh, so I, ke I kept uh, thinking about it and, and studying, attending masses or as they say, Novus Ordo uh, services uh, for a long time. And then uh, I really didn't do anything concerning vocation. I mean, actually starting anything uh, when I was still in Novus Ordo, that only became a very serious thought after I found traditional Catholic faith. Interesting. So, so then, Father, did you find that traditional Catholicism during your, your studies, or, or how did you find that? Well, it's... Um, uh, it didn't happen right away because uh, after I joined the Novus Ordo Church, uh, you know, the, as you probably know, the basic idea of a Novus Ordo Church is that we are really basically all the same, you know, Lutheran, Orthodox, Catholic, you know, uh, just, the, just the same. And, you know, that was my tendency to think as well that um, I just had joined to the, maybe the best church there is, but that there are other churches uh, as uh, well, uh, but uh, since I liked history, I also loved studying church history. So I already told you about the French Revolution martyrs, but I also, mm, of course, uh, knew about the great history of the Catholic Counter Reformation. There was uh, Saint Pius V, uh, 
uh, there was the newfound zeal for Catholicism, all these uh, religious uh, orders. And uh, in the 1500s, Catholic Church was truly militant church who was very fierce and sincere uh, and zealous for her faith. So I always kind of thought that, you know, well, too bad that the church is not like that anymore because uh, I like uh, very zealous preaching. I like when the religious doctrines are taught very clearly uh, uh, in manner. So first it started just my interest in traditional Catholicism. Catholicism, it just started to be kind of an um, attraction for nostalgia, you know, so our church used to be like this in the past, you know, very much against Protestantism, very much against the, all the modern things which uh, are in the world, and, you know, too bad that <laughs> we cannot be uh, like that. So at this point, I didn't know anything about traditional Catholic movement. Uh, this is the period in the late 90s and early 2000s, because there were no traditional Catholics uh, in uh, Finland. So I knew nothing about uh, Archbishop Lefebvre or Sedeva Kantism. Uh, it was just an, first my idea that, you know, well, too bad what, that the church cannot be what it uh, used to be. So uh, the, And um, only later on, I discovered that hmm, there actually are groups who keep the Catholic faith exactly as it was in the 1500s and who even have the mass said in Latin and uh, in the same way as it was in the 1500s. And did you find that father, I, I, I assume through the internet or, or how did you, how did you find traditional Catholicism? As you say, if you have a country that it, it doesn't really even exist, that, that couldn't have been an easy thing to just stumble upon. Uh, no, I think I first time read about Archbishop Lefebvre and Society of St. Pius X uh, from our diocesan newspaper. Uh, there, were, there was again a period when that society was having uh, ongoing, offgoing negotiations with the Vatican. And then, um, first it struck me very odd that you know, there was a supposedly Catholic group who is negotiating with the Pope or John Paul II, who uh, at that time was uh, uh, claiming that there was a group of Catholics who was negotiating with the Pope, was negotiating with the church, how to be part of that uh, church. So that struck me as uh, very odd, you know, that, you know, because I, of course, had uh, got into the idea that, you know, well, if the man is the Pope, then you follow him and if you join the Catholic Church, you join to a diocese and a parish, you know, so, so that's sounded very strange. Uh, but I always um, like to go and learn about new things, uh, you know, especially living in Finland, you know, so it was oftentimes hard to study about things. So I decided to go and see myself, you know, what was this uh, group, uh, because Society of St. Pius X they had a small apostolate in uh, Sweden, and since I have relatives and family in Sweden, in Stockholm area, I knew how to uh, get there. So I decided that, you know, well, since I like church history and since this group seems to preserve the faith and the liturgy, at this it was done in previous times before the Second Vatican Council, I will go and check it out. Interesting. So... I guess the the obvious question is, what were your impressions? What what did you think, even though you had some concerns already about their position? I, how did you feel about it? I guess that, that, that would have been your first experience of the Latin Mass, too, I assume. Uh, oh, yes, it, it was and funny that you should ask that, because, uh, yes, I remember my first experience uh, about the traditional Catholic uh, Mass, because I've read so many conversion stories that, you know, when person first time saw the Latin Mass, they were all in and you know they uh, thought that it was so elevating and great uh, and they knew that they had come home <laughs> that was not my experience at all and in the first the first time when i saw a tridentine low mass which was said in stockholm by society of saint Pius the 10th priest uh, i remember it it looked very odd to me you know so i i knew 
enough Latin from the Novus Ordo services that I could kind of uh, watch the priest and realize a little bit what he was uh, doing, but you know, no singing, you know, all Latin, uh, some gestures, you know, which I didn't uh, get. So I remember coming out from that mess from the uh, chapel and thinking, well, you know, well, it was a nice experience, but I really don't understand what all the fuss about this uh, uh, old mess. So, so uh, but after I first time I saw the uh, traditional Latin mass, I also started to started to study more and more about the traditional faith. And then little by little, I started to see that there was a um, contradiction between how the faith was preached previously, you know, in the, all those times of the 1500s and all the times of during French Revolution and how it was preached now in my home country and in my in the home parish. Uh, so, even, so even though I didn't got into the group of Society of St. Pius X and there was still so many things to be learned, at least this first touch with traditional Catholicism showed me clearly that there is a big difference how, what the church preached previously and then what that institution, which I thought was the church, was preaching now. And when I realized that there was this contradiction, then I started, started to study more about the things like the mass, you know, so, and, you know, that service which I see in my home parish, you know, is it really a mass or not, or about other sacraments, uh, uh, have they been kept as they had been throughout the church history, and little by little I realized that uh, they were uh, not. So you can see that um, my conversion to traditional Catholic faith, it didn't happen all at once, but, you know, it was a long process, you know, studying, checking things, you know, thinking, praying, you know, so which eventually led me to conclusion that, you know, well, not only not only different movements, but actually different faith and different church. Well, I think that's, that's a beautiful story, though, Father, because I think that's actually really helpful to people that I, I would imagine the people who are seeing the issues in the in the Nova Soto Church and in the, the R&R movement, the SSPX and others, that they, they see the problems and they, they, they don't know what to do. And, and, they, and I think they probably do see these stories of immediate, quote unquote, conversion or the immediate realization that there, there is no true pope and hasn't been since 1958. That, you know, that, as you say, that emotional response of you see the Latin mass and boom, it's, it's, a, it's solved. Or you, you read one book and boom, it's solved. And, and, and some, for some people, it works that way. But I, I think that's a really good thing to hear from you that, that it wasn't easy. And I, and I think it is a step-by-step -step process for many people. And what you did, as you said, is you, you, you kept studying, you wanted the truth, and, and eventually, eventually, if you keep searching for the truth, God will show it to you. And that's, that's really neat. I, I appreciate that story, Father. And so, so after you, you made that conclusion, what came next? Uh, well, I was still finishing up my studies in the University of Helsinki, um, because um, I eventually got my master's degree uh, from uh, there. So, and then came that moment which I had to kind of decide what I want to do in my life, you know. So there was career choice, of course, you know, do I want to be a professor or what do I uh, want to do? But there was this religious choice which I also had to uh, made that, you know, do I want to be a Catholic? Do I want to practice the religion not as the modernists uh, uh, practice it, but how it was practiced in the times of martyrs, in the times of 1500s, in the times of the uh, French Revolution. And um, I decided that, uh, yes, I want to be a Catholic, but as, with, as it was with the St. Uh, Pius X uh, group uh, and with the um, traditional Latin Mass, I didn't just want to read and study about the traditional Catholic faith. I also wanted to see it myself. 
So uh, I made a big decision to visit the United States, visit the uh, different traditional Catholic uh, groups. And um, one of the places I contacted was St. Gertrude the uh, Great. And then um, I knew already that Father Chicada was a big name in, in traditional uh, Catholic uh, movement. And then uh, he, he held in the position, which I later on learned was called Sedevacantism. So uh, he seemed to be in kind of a fringe uh, part of the traditional Catholic movement. But I really enjoyed his uh, writings. Uh, I really enjoyed his, uh, his sense of humor and especially that he presented the traditional Catholic faith so clearly that anybody, anyone could understand it and also very cl clearly showed that there's not only a difference between what the modernist church is teaching and what the true church is uh, teaching. There's a direct contradiction. Uh, so one of the places I decided to visit was St. Gertrude the Great and this was in December of 2006, and um, I came here and I had a long discussion with Father Chicada and also with uh, Bishop Dolan. So it wasn't anything what, I mean, of course, reading and studying was a big part of my conversion, but uh, what really did it for me, as you say, was to meet Bishop Dolan and Father Chekada personally to hear their story about their seminary training, their later figuring out things, and that I could also tell my story to them and then ask whatever kind of a questions uh, I had and whatever kind of a doubts I might had um, about the traditional Catholic uh, faith. I always find it much easier to make big decisions like <laughs> conversion if you actually speak with somebody personally and uh, even though I like reading I always uh, love to check things out myself so that was my purpose of visiting St. Gertrude uh, great at the end of my university studies. And I think that's that's great advice father again for the people who are searching for the truth it's a confusing time. It's hard to know what is what, where's, where's the church, who's the Pope, who's not the Pope. And I think, as you say, you can find a lot of stuff reading. You, you can find plenty of stuff on Twitter and Facebook and you, you find some good material, but you're going to find a lot of garbage too. And I think that, as you say, it's so important if you can get that chance, go and sit down with somebody, with a priest who, who, who is literally an expert in this field and say, okay, you know, what, what's going on? I think I could not recommend that enough as well, that I know it's not always easy for people, but boy, is it worth it to actually get the straight answers and not just get this weird chaos that comes from social media and and, 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 and the confusion that I think probably can come from if you're just reading for yourself to actually get that you know, consultation, I suppose, in person. I think that, that that's a definitely good advice. And so, Father, after that, did you, I assume you went back to, to Finland, but then did you go right back to the U.S. or what did you do? And. Um, you mean after my conversation with Father Chicago? Exactly, right. Yes, uh, I, um, I um, had some uh, things in my university studies I still needed to finish, but already after speaking with, with the bishop and with Father, I had made my decision that, yes, I want to be a traditional uh, Catholic. And that also I thought about it and uh, I had spoken with Father Chekada my idea that, you know, I have this thing that you know, I might want also to be a priest. And then Father Chekada, um, he was always so great in uh, tracing any possible vocations. So in my first visit, uh, he got me right away in touch uh, with uh, Bishop Sanborn and then uh, uh, we talked about that, you know, so that uh, now it's a good time because I'm just about to finish my studies. And then if you have a, and even if you think that you have a vocation uh, for priesthood, you should go for it. So I went back to Finland, but all the time I was in contact with uh, Bishop Sanborn and, uh, and, did, and planning 
my next visit to United States, namely to visit the seminary. The first visit uh, was to find out uh, if I wanted to be a Catholic or not. And then a couple of months after my visit, I visited the seminary to find out if I want to be a priest or not. Because um, again, the same process uh, kind of was uh, repeated. So I knew uh, pretty certainly before my visit uh, to St. Gertrude's that I want to be a traditional Catholic, but I wanted to check the things myself. And after I spoke with Father Chikada, I had a, I was already pretty convinced that I would want to be a priest as well. But again, I wanted to see things myself. I wanted to visit the seminary to um, see what kind of a place it is, what kind of a teaching they offer there, what are the studies, you know, who is in charge of the seminary. So a couple of months after my first visit, uh, I went to see uh, Bishop Sanborn and uh, visited Most Holy Trinity uh, Seminary. So uh, same process uh, was repeated with uh, becoming a priest as it was, you know, becoming a traditional Catholic. And and then so uh, obviously that that conversation must have gone well because here you are as as a priest, of course. So so when when did that? I guess when did that continue? When when did you decide to to become a to become it or try out the seminary at least? And and how was that? How was that experience? I, I asked Father uh, in Kamake too. Was that was that a hard thing when you went to the U.S.? Was it hard culturally to get used to the the American way? I suppose. Well, and it was uh, because uh, I grew up in Finland and I knew all the things I knew about America was just from uh, from a TV. You know, for myself, America was. Uh, in a, a kind of a, like a Emerald City in the Wonderful Wizard of Oz, you know? so I, it seemed almost like a fairy tale place, and I never thought that I would even visit there, still less uh, live there. And I remember first time visiting New York City, and I stood there and uh, at the Fifth Avenue and was just amazed at all this amount of people, uh, uh, millions of people, and all these huge buildings and skyscrapers. So but it was a shock only at the very beginning. So, but you know, I got used to uh, it. Uh, you know, so at the, that time, seminary was uh, in uh, Florida and you know, it was a pleasant surrounding. Well, weather was pretty exhausting <laughs> occasionally uh, there, but uh, uh, more than being a cultural shock, uh, it was, it got me a little bit getting used to of following strict seminary schedule. Because you know, now in the seminary, everything is regulated. What, what time you rise up, uh, uh, when to do your meditation, when is the mass, when is breakfast, when is, uh, in, uh, when the studies are, and even your times of recreation, you know exactly when, uh, when they are. So that got a uh, little bit of uh, getting used to. But um, since um, I had uh, decided that I want to go to seminary to at least try this, to see if I have a vocation uh, or not. And, you know, I was perfectly happy with the idea that, well, you know, I'm there under my, uh, under the obedience of my superiors and they are the ones who give me teaching they are the ones who uh, watch over me and look uh, look if i have a vocation or not so i decided that they have all the knowledge they have all the experience so that if i have a vocation it will be uh, a wonderful blessing for me and uh, for finland uh, as well and then if i for some reason wouldn't have a vocation at least I have found the faith, I have found the uh, truth, and whatever happens to me uh, in life, I know that my soul is well taken care of. And so then, uh, how long did it take before you, you knew that you're going you're gonna to stick this through? And when, when were you ordained, Father? Um, well, I joined the seminary in 2007, and I was ordained um, in November in 2011 by Bishop Dolan. My ordination was 
uh, in 2011 at St. Gertrude, the uh, great uh, church. I still had some seminary uh, uh, studies to finish. So after my ordination, I went back to Florida and finished my uh, studies. So I graduated from the seminary in uh, 2012 and then moved to uh, Cincinnati to serve Bishop Dolan at St. Gertrude the Great. And did you ever end up back in Finland, Father? Because obviously now you're back at St. Gertrude's, which I, I'm sure, it especially now, very much needs you. But did you did you go to Finland for a time as a priest? Well, it was a seminary, and I went there for my vacations. Uh, but um, I have, after my ordination, I have been there again a couple of times. You know, just about a week. Um, but I haven't done that lately because uh, the world situation is what it is. So uh, last time I went to Finland was in summer 2018. So it's over four years now. So, well, how the world turns out to be, just have to see when I have the chance to do that next. Sure. It, it's same same for me, Father. I haven't been in the U.S. since 2018 as well. It's, it's, it's kind of a, a hard thing to to have imagined back four years ago that it, I, at the time I thought I'll be, I'll go back to the U S every year. Or it'll be easy. And then boy, you, you get, you, you hit, the world slaps you in the face a little bit, I suppose. And you, you wake up and realize, okay, well, I'm, I guess I am where I am and that may be where I'm stuck. And so father, so you've been, have you been then stationed at St. Gertrude's uh, since your ordination or, or have you traveled around? Uh, yes. Uh, almost all my time I stay here at St. Saint- Gertrude, and the reason is uh, mainly because I teach in our school, and uh, when you are a teacher in the school, it uh, very efficiently ties you in one uh, place, because, you know, from Monday morning until Friday afternoon, you have to um, be in your classroom and uh, teaching uh, the children, and uh, sometimes I have been able to do some mission trips on weekends, but... Uh, most of the time I stay here and it's only during the times when school is not in session, like on Christmas break or Easter break or summer vacation when I go to other missions and parishes to serve there. And I know, Father, that you wanted to talk about a bit of what, of what is going on, I suppose, at St. Gertrude's. And I know that the last year, of course, has been a, a very tough, but the last few years have been really very hard, of course, for St. Gertrude's, of course, losing Bishop Dolan and Father Chakad in the last few years. And I'm sure that's also changed your role. I don't know if, I don't know how much you want to talk about how much it's changed or if you want to talk about Bishop Dolan or Father Chikata, anything you want to say? Yes, uh, well, maybe I just wanted to mention that uh, I really miss them both, uh, even at this uh, uh, point, uh, Bishop Dolan, um, we lost him so suddenly. And, you know, I lost uh, a man who was not only my bishop and uh, my superior, but, you know, whom I really regarded as a father in in faith. And then uh, Father Chikada, he was uh, always so kind ever since my vocation. uh, He was always so kind and supportive. And, you know, rest of the world, they know Father Chikada through his writings and, you know, they know him as a uh, great uh, intellect uh, and uh, somebody with great humor and uh, know from his uh, wit and of course he was uh, all that a great scholar and everything but uh, I really knew him um, mostly from his uh, great and sweet heart you know so he was always so supportive and, and um, much more than his uh, writings and his academic skills I miss that great and sweet heart, you know, tremendously. But uh, I, I wanted to do him a favor after he died, so I edited together all his published uh, writings. Uh, and um, because uh, one of the activities I do here is to publish uh, a book, so I put together a three-volume set uh, of everything. What uh, well, almost everything of the articles which uh, Father Chagada had published uh, and uh, in that way hope that his legacy and his scholarly work and his uh, great sense of humor is also passed to uh, new generations of traditional Catholics. 
Absolutely, Father. I hope so, too. I mean, he, he was ab- no, no question a hero of the faith and boy, one that was so desperately needed in, in, in the times that, that the church has gone through in the last 60, 70 years. And, and, and now, Father, I guess it's, it's, a, it's a new time, I suppose, in a way that you have, you had four new priests ordained. Um, that was a, a year ago now, recently. <laughs> I guess I should, I should no, know. It was, but, uh, it, it was uh, this year in May. It was this but, year. Wow. Yes, uh, but no, lots has happened uh, since uh, that. Um, but um, Bishop McGuire, he's the new pastor, and he has still many things uh, uh, to uh, learn, as uh, as he himself uh, says. But uh, we priests here, we are a community who always support each other. So whatever new roles, and we all had to assume new roles since Bishop Dolan died so suddenly, but we all support each other, and we have our own group of priests called Salesian Sacerdotal Society, uh, and uh, we serve our uh, parishes, we serve our missions, we uh, support uh, each other, and, um, and we rely so much on the help from our faithful, and of course, from the prayers uh, of, the, uh, of the faithful. Well, and, and Father, it's a beautiful thing when I when I spoke with Father and Kamake and to see the growth that they have in in Nigeria, it's incredible. I mean, I mean, it's really it's really amazing thing to see that they kind of starting again from nothing. I mean, real or very little uh, in terms of traditional Catholicism, and now they have I think Father said nine seminarians mm-hmm. and two new yeah. young priests, and that's and that's another. I'll definitely attach um, to this to this podcast. I'll attach the the Sinker to the Greats um, donation page, and and anyone I think. I believe there's a way that you can also donate to Father and Comic Case specifically or to St. Gertrude's. Um, because, boy, I mean, if, if there's a better mission to support, I mean, that these two young priests who are in Africa now, they, they literally need cars to be able to drive around and, and, and reach the faithful. So really, really a need. And, and they're building it. They, they bought a new seminary that needs a lot of work that's very bare. Father, Father and Comic Case showed me a video of it, and it's it's big and it looks like it, it has a lot of, my, my mom would say it has good bones. It has good bones, but it, but it needs some work. It needs some, some, some literal furniture and stuff. So, so please, anyone watching this, go um, to the link that I'll provide here, support St. Gertrude, support uh, Father Nakamake. And as Father, Father said, definitely, most importantly, support them with their prayers. And, and Father, I don't, is there anything you want to say to, to wrap things up about St. Gertrude's, about what's going on? I, I saw recently that there's there are new um, oblates of the Holy Face. That that was something that I think is very recent. Is that something that you want to speak on? Uh, yes, uh, we have lots of parish activities groups. I think it all started my own involvement in those uh, groups that uh, since I teach school children, I always, since I liked not only reading, but also writing and publishing. So I started to write some little books uh, to the children uh, of the, of the parish. Unfortunately, uh, I found a, a traditional Catholic uh, publisher, namely St. Jerome School and Library, who had the ability to help me in publishing these uh, things. So first book for children, which I wrote, uh, was actually a collection of sermons I had given from the uh, pulpit during our annual ghost camp. So, uh, so I started book publishing, which is one of my personal apostolates to try to um, help to keep the faith going, especially among younger generations. Uh, and then um, uh, later on, that uh, and, uh, led to an idea that maybe we could um, establish a group also for uh, girls and young ladies uh, who would be able to help in the parish uh, and the not well not only help but also to get together and have a good time together because how we at St. Gertrude we are parish priests so we want to offer to our faithful as much good activity in the parish as uh, possible so a couple of years ago we started a group for girls and young ladies called Sodality of Charity and we have a uh, monthly meetings uh, there and then um, the girls help us a little bit in the parish work like <laughs> polishing candle followers and also doing flowers in the uh, in the church but they also have their own fun activities like 
crafts, uh, movies, you know, archery, and those uh, things. But uh, do we want? I wanted to offer them something which is both fun and helps the parish, and it has worked uh, very well because these uh, young ladies, their mothers, in their turn, they were such a great help for Bishop Dolan and Father Chicada because uh, we at the parish we really rely on the voluntary effort which the faithful uh, gave us. And then uh, before Bishop Dolan died, uh, we decided that uh, so some of these girls uh, who liked parish activities, like help us in the parish, maybe they would like to do that full time. So that there came the idea of having oblate sisters who work in the sacristy and who work uh, in the school that are they dedicate their time to help the priests and especially their prayers for uh, for the priests so we are very blessed that uh, this year we have started our own uh, group of uh, uh, sisters and um, not only are they helping in the parish but they also do acts of reparation uh, for the sins of the uh, world so this parish activity is uh, uh, very important uh, for us because we don't want to just preach, you know, how bad the world is and how much sin there is in the world. Of course, we do our share of that as well. But we want to tell the faithful uh, uh, that being a Catholic is not doom and gloom, but it's something which is joyful. And then uh, it's uh, something because uh, and also that if there's much evil in the world, we Catholics are called to do acts of reparation, acts of reparation to Sacred Heart, to the uh, Holy Face, and those are so, so much uh, needed uh, in our world. So have a good time for our young people and for our uh, faithful, uh, teaching them devotions so that they feel that the parish is their home, and also teaching them acts of reparation, like, you know, our rosary processions. Uh, that's really kind of work what we at St. Gertrude uh, really want to do, and uh, which we did under the guidance of Bishop Dolan for so many years and, and decades, and which we will now continue to do under the guidance of uh, Bishop McGuire. It's great, Father. And I think it, it sounds exactly how I picture a, a, a life should be at a at a parish. I mean, it should be it should be active. And I think it's something I talk about all the time on the podcast is how important it is for the lay people to to be active and into for their own good, for the sake of, of the church, for the sake of the priests, for the sake of the nuns, but also for, for themselves, because really deep down what we what we we really do crave work and suffering. We don't think we do, but but it, because that's God's will, that's, of course, what we actually want. We just got to get past our, our own will and realize that that, that, that going and po polishing the candles in, in, in the church is is a very incredibly beautiful thing to be able to do. We, you just have to kind of get past that step of, oh, I don't really want to polish candles <laughs> in the sacristy. But 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 it, it, that's beautiful, Father. It's, it's really great to hear what's going on with St. Gertrude's. I, I see fairly often videos of the masses and um, everything always looks so beautiful and so devout. And the choir's, the choir's phenomenal. I, I really enjoy that. And I, I listen to it before Father Chicada passed away as well. And I know he was obviously very, very big into the, or, or he, he put a lot into the choir and into the organ. And, and I think that you can still, you can still hear that. And I think that that's, again, it's, it's a, it's a testament to, to Father Chicada and I'm sure others as well, that, that, that still remains and still goes on, even though he, he is no longer here. And that's, that's a, that's a neat thing to see. Yes, yes and definitely. And I would, if you allow me to add still that, uh, of course, in St. Gertrude, we have a large number of people, and so we can have a lot, uh, big amount of activity and all this fun. And um, most of our missions, and I know many of the missions in this country, they are very small. So obviously not every place uh, or parish or mass center can do all these kind of uh, activities, but even a little group should at least some way keep in connection with each other. And for example, on Sundays, if there is no priest available coming to say, uh, say mass, 
that the faithful should get together, perhaps watch the mass uh, broadcast uh, together, say the rosary, and then uh, spend uh, some uh, quality time, as they say, uh, to, together, you know, doing good things they enjoy, maybe uh, watch a movie, maybe have a book club, or any kind of activity which they would uh, like, so that they uh, remain in contact with uh, each other and not just stay uh, in their in their house. Uh, uh, it's uh, being a mem be a mem member of a Catholic church. You are a member of the community, and the more contact you keep with the other Catholics, that also the more joyfully, at least most of it, more joyful, at least most of the time, uh, your life as a Catholic can be. Perfect, Father. Father, do you have any last words before we go? Uh, no, not particularly. I just wanted to thank you, Kevin, of this, uh, uh, this uh, opportunity from our website and from our websites. Uh, we, you definitely find uh, much more information than what I was able uh, to give. And you know, I'm looking forward to speak uh, with uh, you again. And if I could just uh, end with a prayer, please. Please, Father. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. O adorable face of my Jesus, so mercifully bowed down upon the tree of the cross on the day thou didst die for the salvation of man. Now again incline in thy pity toward us poor sinners. Cast upon us a look of compassion and receive us to the kiss of peace, amen. Sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Saint Veronica, pray for us. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Perfect. Thank you, Father. God bless you. Yeah, God bless you, Kevin.